right, if we could have our next set of presenters come on up. We have one more panel. Great, thank you. And then uh, right after this panel, we'll be announcing our poster winners for the conference as well. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Jake Delmini from University of Kentucky, who's going to talk about the effect of emergency call volume on occupational stress exposure and sleep quality in urban firefighters. All right, well, I commend you all for making it this far. We're in the home stretch. <laughs> Um, so my name is Jake Gelmini. I'm actually a, a third year doctoral candidate at the University of Kentucky. Um, so I work underneath the Occupational Athletic Training Corps as well as with the Sports Medicine Research Institute. I'm really excited to show you one of the projects and one of a few projects that we've been working on uh, at the SMRI at UK. So a couple learning objectives uh, for this talk, uh, the first being to identify the effect of firefighter emergency call volume on occupational stress and sleep. Second, to compare the use of different subjective methods uh, assessing exertion, stress, and sleep. And then also thirdly, to recognize the potential use of physiological monitoring as a method of assessing workload. So the first thing I wanted to discuss is when we're looking at injury in firefighting. So overuse injury is by far the highest reported cause of fire ground injury on an annual basis. Now, when we're talking about fire ground injury, we're talking about injuries that are taking place where there's an actual burning building or whatever the actual structure fire that's on that's going on there. And if you look at the bottom of this graph, you can see that the number one cause of injury with fire ground injury is related to overexertion and strain. And the percentages are roughly about the same on an annual basis. However, this is not just a fire ground problem. In fact, when we look at non-fire ground injuries, these sprains, strains, and muscular pain or musculoskeletal injuries are the highest incidence uh, highest incidence rate of all non-fatal injuries in firefighting. Now, this becomes a twofold issue. One, not only is this a physical hardship for the actual firefighter themselves as they're returning to work and trying to get back to active duty status, but also becomes a tremendous time and financial burden for individual fire companies. And as you can see some of the data here, and when you actually adjust it with inflation, that as a result of musculoskeletal injuries, for individual fire companies becomes roughly between half a million to a million dollars plus in workers' compensation and medical claims. Now, as an athletic trainer, the question that we want to answer is, well, how can we mitigate these injuries? Like, what's the root cause of this? That's the golden thing, right? Well, as far as some of the possible factors that might be alluding to firefighter injury, sleep deprivation and job stress seem to be the two possible factors. However, one of the issues with this is that we don't have a measure of monitoring firefighter exposure prospectively or longitudinally. Now, when we look at traditional athletics, and this is awesome because it was touched on yesterday looking at police officers, they were talking about workload monitoring. And in traditional athletics, this is one uh, model that is used to prospectively observe and minimize injury risk. And so we're looking at an individual's load over time and the amount of exposure that they are, whether it be a soccer player or if it's a pitcher, et cetera. And we use this model to look at a method of minimizing the likelihood of subsequent or potential injury. And you can see this here, looking at percent changes week to week. Now here becomes the problem. Firefighters are not soccer players. They're not baseball players. We can't monitor how many pitches they're throwing, how many miles that they're running, et cetera. But what we can measure is the number of calls 
that they're responding to on a day-to-day -day basis. So the, that is essentially the question that we're trying to answer is can we use a, a similar model in traditional athletics in firefighting? So currently there is no measure of quantifying uh, or monitoring firefighter load. So the question is, well, what role does emergency call volume have on occupational stress exposure and sleep quality? And that was essentially the purpose of this study. So we had two main hypotheses for this study. And the first, uh, more related to uh, uh, measures of exertion and stress exposure. So if a firefighter were to respond to a greater number of emergency calls, then they will report a higher subjective rate of perceived exertion, and as well as demonstrate depressed race, resting HRV or heart rate variability values after a 24-hour work shift. Secondly, if emergency calls influence objective and subjective measures of sleep, then emergency call volume may be a confounder of sleep hygiene. So just a quick snapshot of what this methodology looked like. We had a total of 34 uh, participants or 34 firefighters who enrolled in this study. The study duration was uh, six months and we just recently finished it at the end of this past year. And we assessed them during and after each 24 hour shift. And I have a schematic I'll show in the coming slides. As far as how we collected the data. So I mentioned we collected it both objectively and subjectively. So one of the nuances that we did with this study is for our objective measurements, we were using uh, what's called a whoop strap. So a whoop strap, very similar technology to what you would see with like a Garmin watch, Apple watch, as far as how it's capturing heart rate and those kinds of metrics. And it does export a, a, lot of, a lot of variables, more than we even possibly need. But the two that we were using for this analysis was we collected heart rate variability as well as the number of hours of sleep that they experienced when they were on duty. And they wore these for a total of six months. And as an added bonus, and this was a way for us to get interested participants, was in addition to volunteering for the study, they also had full access to the app and to the, uh, to the product, much like a similar consumer would, for that six-month duration. As far as for the subjective measures, the way that we measured perceived exertion was, is through what's called the Borg Rate of Perceived Exertion Scale. So if you've done any sort of exercise testing or any sort of method that way, uh, you may have seen this scale at some point in time. And we use the Borg scale because a lot of the workload monitoring uh, research that's done in athletics, they use the RPE scale as well. So the way that we phrased it for each firefighter was, hey, how would you grade shift? How tough was shift? Does it have to be physical, mental, emotional, just a culmination of all that? Just give us on a scale of six to 20. So six being no exertion, all the way to 20 being maximal exertion. In addition, we also asked for their subjective level of sleepiness, and we used it from a one question, one question questionnaire, uh, the Karolinska sleepiness scale, and this was on a scale of one to 10, one being extremely alert, all the way to 10 being extremely sleepy. Lastly, how we collected call volume. So we collected call volume two different ways. We collected it, one, as a count metric, so how many calls did they go on over a 24-hour period, whether it be one call, five, 10, et cetera. In addition, we also collected it in terms of total run time. So what do we mean by total run time? So that's how many minutes a firefighter was away from the station responding to an emergency call over the course of a 24-hour period. In addition to total run time, we were also interested in the total runtime after midnight and how many, how many minutes they were away from the station responding to calls after midnight. And then lastly, when we're looking at on the right side there with shift unit, we were also interested in seeing if the type of apparatus that they are on for that shift influences those variables I just described. So when it says EC, the, whether they're on the ambulance, they'd be emergency care. So if they were assigned to the ambulance, a fire engine, a ladder truck, which is like the really big truck, and then if it wasn't under those three categories, they went into the other. So here's a quick schematic of the shift cycle that they have based on that 24, 48 hour shift cycle. So you can see here, what we were focusing on specifically is the sleep values for the 24 hour scale, and then uh, the, the 7 a.m. period at the end of the 24 for HRV, the KSS, and RPE, those were the values that we collected and we were using for this specific talk. As far as statistical analyses, uh, we ran a general linear model with repeated measures analyses uh, with co compound symmetry correlation measurement. Fancy word for what we did was we were looking at a very globalized uh, regression analysis. The repeated measures analyses is to account for the fact that they were being assessed every 
every uh, 72 hours, every time they came off shift. And the compound symmetry piece is accounting for the high correlation with each individual because each individual, you know, within each person, they're gonna be highly correlated with each other. So this is accounting for that. And it gives the analyses a little bit more power. In addition, before the general linear model, as far as for model inclusion, uh, to determine model inclusion, we ran a correlation matrix, which I will show on the coming slides. And then should collinearity exist, uh, any independent variables that were strongly correlated, uh, the stronger of the two was included. And I'll show you an example in just a moment. Lastly, for measuring model performance, we use the FIT statistics, or specifically the AIC. Uh, for those that are familiar with linear regression, the standard error of the estimate we use to determine model performance. The FIT statistic for this specific model is uh, analogous to that. So here's a quick snapshot of the participants as well as the outcomes that we were looking at. And I wanted to draw your attention to just some of the highlights of this specific group. So average age being just over 35 years, so a fairly experienced group of firefighters. And as you can see, roughly around 10 years of total firefighter service, eight years specifically with this local fire department. And as far as looking at the outcomes that we were looking at, regardless of the type of shift or number of calls that a person was responding to, each firefighter was getting just above five hours of sleep on a good day, you, we can see. And you can see with the range here, um, I at first thought it was a typo when I was going through the data, but the lowest, uh, the, the minimum value being a half hour on duty, all the way up to 10 and a half hours of sleep over the course of a 24 hour shift. Now looking at the uh, correlation uh, matrix here, there were two main parts I wanna draw your attention to, specifically those that are highlighted in red. So the first one in the top left, that is looking at the relationship between the total runs, again, that count data, relative to the total run time. And unsurprisingly, the more calls that they respond to, the more minutes they're gonna be away from the station. So there's no surprise that that's a fairly strong correlation. In addition, when we're looking at total runs after midnight, as well as the total run time after midnight, again, unsurprisingly, the more calls they respond to after midnight, the more minutes they're gonna be away from the station. So the reason why I wanted to draw your attention to this is because of the high collinearity or the collinearity existing between those two variables, for the regression or for the general linear models, only total run time and total run time after midnight was included because there was a stronger relationship relative to the uh, dependent variables. So this is a little tough to see on the screen. Actually, it's a little bit I thought, uh, but I do have a, a simplified version just so easier for everybody to read. But what I wanted to walk through real quick for this, uh, in the interest of time, uh, on the left side here of these models, this is uh, predicting uh, the Borg rate of perceived exertion. On the left, we have total run time, total run time after midnight, sleep duration, shift unit, again, those uh, what apparatus they were on during their shift, as well as the interaction terms associated with each. And then at the bottom, we have our fit statistics. And again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna shrink this down, and we're just gonna focus on the one highlighted in red. It says that was our best performing model. And what we found for rate of perceived exertion was total run time in tandem with sleep duration were the strongest predictors of RPE. In other words, as total run time goes up or they're responding to more calls, their rate of perceived exertion subsequently increased as well. And uh, on the other side of things, looking at the hours of sleep that they had while they were on duty, the more hours of sleep that they experienced on duty, RPE then went subsequently down. When we looked at subjective levels of sleepiness, I'll skip ahead real quick, we actually found interestingly the same two variables in tandem were the strongest predictors of subjective sleepiness found on duty. It was total run time and sleep duration. So the next question that we wanted to look at in terms of sleep quality or just in sleep in general, does call volume influence relative or uh, variables or factors related to sleep in, uh, in, in actuality? So looking at sleep duration, we found that total run time and total run time after midnight in tandem uh, were the strongest predictors of sleep duration. And this is not surprising that the more time over the course of a shift, if they're responding to more calls, they have less opportunities to sleep when they're working. And then more so too, the more calls that they're responding to after midnight, obviously they can't be working because they're doing their job. 
So some study limitations, uh, we did have a smaller sample size that we had hoped for, and this was limited to the band availability. Moving forward, we have some different ways that which we're gonna be collecting or uh, uh, for further studies that will allow us to capture a bigger sample size. Also, uh, we didn't find any statistical uh, difference in terms of heart rate variability, and that may be due to uh, some of the limitations with the sensor, especially how they're ca uh, capturing heart rate variability and the algorithm at which they use to calculate and capture that value. Lastly, we didn't track uh, any on-duty food or drink intake, and also the evaluation of call volume may also be influenced by different types of calls, and I'll admit, uh, allude to that in just a moment. So some conclusions that we found, RPE and subjective sleepiness, uh, total run time and on-duty sleep accounted for the greatest model performance. And then looking at uh, sleep on duty, total run time and total run time after midnight were uh, the strongest predictors. And lastly, heart rate variability did not show any statistical, uh, uh, statistical significance. However, moving forward, one of the things that we're interested in is looking at the types of calls. So I mentioned we were looking to see, is call volume at face value even an appropriate metric of monitoring firefighter load? Well, we were treating every call one-to-one. -one. And one of the issues with that is if they're going to, say, a burning building versus if they're getting a cat out of a tree, we're kind of treating it apples to apples, and that's obviously not necessarily the case. So we're interested in seeing, well, does the type of call influence all of those factors we were just describing earlier? Also, how does the changes in workload day to day or week to week change uh, their perception or what they're experiencing in terms of pain and soreness, getting more towards that symptomology? And then secondly, moving towards more the recovery off duty. How uh, the workload they're experiencing during that first 24 hours, how is it, what are their experiences as they're getting ready to start that next shift and how the types of calls and the volume at which they're responding to these calls may influence those factors? So lastly, I want to give a few acknowledgments this, uh, just for the Central Appalachian Regional ERC, the pilot funds that helped support this work. Uh, Dr. Sanderson, the whole crew, they've been phenomenal with us from the start. They've been a great, awesome, uh, great group to work with. All the individuals at the SMRI, including my uh, doctoral committee, as well as the members of the Occupational Athletic Training Corps. And then lastly, I'd like to thank the members of the Lexington Fire Department. They've been instrumental in this partnership that we've started, and we're hoping and looking forward to continuing this partnership with them, for not only for a lot of our athletic training services, but also for the research endeavors that we're hoping to pursue. Thank you. Great, wonderful, thank you so much. Our second speaker is also going to be presenting in person, and then our final two speakers are presenting virtually. So next, I'd like to welcome Joseph Regina from University of South Florida, who's going to talk with us about invisible families and clear consequences, work family integra integration among LGBTQ employees. So thank you. Welcome. First things first, thank you all for having me. Um, my slides aren't up. I thought they were. No rush, it's all good. Um, so yeah, hi, Joseph Regina. I'm a sixth year um, student right down the block in the PCD building in our psychology department. Um, today's project is funded in part by the Sunshine ERC. It would not have been possible without y'all, so in advance, thank you. Um, today's project is in Invisible Families, Clear Consequences, Work Family Integration Supplies for LGBTQ plus employees. And before I dive into work family for the LGBT community, I want to talk about work family in general. So if we look at the last 20 years, we see a blossoming, booming, whatever word you want to use to say way more work family research now than we used to see. So if we go back to the 90s, we're seeing a handful of papers, if, all, if at all, whereas nowadays we're seeing five to 10, sometimes more. This is just for one journal, but it is pretty representative of our field, I would say. However, while we have a bunch of research on work and family and how they go together, it's largely consistent with heterosexual samples, which creates a problem because it may not necessarily be the same exact experience for other groups such as the LGBT community. And in support, there was a review done in 2021, and what they found was kind of what we'd expect. Some similar experiences. We still see behavioral strain and time-based work-family conflict. We still see those conflicts handled using similar strategies, like asking for help or budgeting time, so on and so forth. However, we also see some unique experiences, which aren't really touched upon in our existing literature. So, in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about the idea of the pressure to segment. 
Before I dive into the formal definition, I want to give you an example of what this might look like. So, this is a quote from a woman. There was a time when my girlfriend was here and she wanted to visit my office, and that stressed me out. It's just the questions that would come after. I feel like she is obviously gay, so people would ask questions. I don't want to lie to people. And the part I really want to highlight is, I don't want to lie to people. Um, adults in the US spend more waking hours at work than they do anywhere else. This person is not just not bringing their full self to work. They feel like they are actively lying to the people that they are spending the majority of their adult waking hours with. Um, as someone that studies stressors and strains and how they go together and how work can inform health and a bunch of other outcomes, this is potentially really problematic because to me, that sounds like a huge stressor with broad and very strong ramifications. So within that Sawyer paper where that quote came from, um, it's framed as an example of work-family conflict. However, when we typically think of work-family conflict in the existing literature, it's more of a collision between domains, like go-karts or bumper cars. Um, the idea being that you have these two domains, and they both want something, and you can't give them both, so they collide. They intersect in a way in which you can't do both. That's not really what we're seeing here. In fact, these two domains are being kept explicitly separate which in a way is not conflict at all. So what can we do? It turns out the work family literature can kind of already inform where to go from here. So this is from 20, 2009. Um, the quotes that I'm gonna show are also from this paper. It's based on Episcopalian priests, really cool read. Um, but the part I wanna highlight is this part in yellow, which is the work home boundary domains. It talks about intrusion and distance. Um, an example of intrusion is gonna look like this. My administrative assistant is always buzzing me about this, that, and the other thing that he could write up and wait until I get back to the office. He's the one most likely to interrupt me at work. In this example, the person is at home, they are, want to be present at home, and their administrative assistant is butting in, so to speak, and that's kind of more akin to the idea of conflict. Distance is a different concern. That's where those domains are kept separate, even though you don't want them to be. An example of that could be, again, I remember the first Sunday, they had a nice reception for me after the service and everything. Then everybody went home and had lunch. It never occurred to them that this is a single person. She doesn't have anyone to get lunch with. We should invite her to lunch. And this example, I think, is more akin to that first quote I showed. They want work and family to overlap, and they don't have the option to do so. So, because of this, we can build out of the existing research on boundary management. It talks about segmentation and integration. Conceptually speaking, this is on one continuum. You either integrate, meaning your work and your family overlap, or you keep them separate. That would be segmentation. And there's multiple lenses you can view this through. So you have preferences. Do you want work and family to overlap? And then you have actual integration behaviors. Do you overlap your work and your family? I tend to integrate. And then we have these environmental supplies, which I think are extremely relevant for the topic we're talking about. And these are the supplies that allow you to integrate if you were to choose to do so. In that first example, it's not that they can't or don't have a preference to. It's that they don't feel as though they are allowed to or able to comfortably. Examples of the types of questions we're gonna use in this study are, my roommate, I'm sorry, <laughs> my romantic partner can contact me at work and I can talk freely about my romantic partner while I am at work. It's the idea not of do you or do you want to, but merely can you. So this creates an interesting conundrum because what we know from the existing literature is that actual integration can be harmful. We see things like lesser recovery, a lesser ability to detach, stop thinking about work, and it also is related to greater work-family conflict. However, in that original quote, it's quite apparent that the LGBTQ plus community may be harmed by a lack of integration supplies, which creates a really interesting conundrum and a chance for theoretical extension, which is perhaps using integration can be harmful while merely having the opportunity to do so is in fact beneficial. So, why may this happen? We can again rely on the existing work family literature, which has used signaling theory. Signaling theory puts forth the idea of the importance of observable actions. Things that you perceive, the things that you take in, inform your way of how the workplace works. For sexual and gender minorities, the idea being that signals of inclusion are going to allow you the perception that you have a greater opportunity or the supplies to integrate. So it's also important that we differentiate between signal types. There are formal signals, these are the objectively present or not present policies and procedures in place. Then we have informal signals, which are your perceptions of the environment, not just what is in the handbook, 
but what is your day-to-day -day lived experience among your work group? And as we all know, if we've ever worked in a large company or university, departments can vary quite significantly in terms of norms and a number of other factors. So to hit home on the importance of differentiating between these two, I'm going to use another quote. Have you figured out that I like quotes yet? Um, so I know I could approach my supervisor and say, hey, I'm going to bring a guy to a company event. I don't want to freak anybody out, but I don't really feel comfortable doing that. In this example, they have the formal signals. They know that they are allowed to. There's no rule saying otherwise. But the informal signals in place are telling them, if I do this, it might not go all that positively for me. So they don't have all the supplies they need. So the full model we are running for my dissertation is as follows. We're going to focus on the first half, which is the formal inclusion signals and informal inclusion signals. Those are thought to relate to the availability of work family supplies. Those are going to be perceived. In turn, we're then going to look at a variety of outcomes in the work domain, job satisfaction, the family or relationship domain, relationship satisfaction, as well as health in the form of burnout. Beyond that, we're also going to test a boundary condition, the idea being that maybe if you don't want to integrate, you have no desire to do so, even if you had the opportunity, then maybe not having those supplies is less harmful for you than somebody who really would like their partner to be present in their work life. So how did we go about testing this really cool model, Joe? I'm digging it, but now what? Um, three time point survey. At time one, we're grabbing demographics. We're also grabbing those inclusion signals. So it's going to be formal policies and procedures, as well as informal, the degree to which your workplace is hostile to LGBTQ plus individuals. We're also grabbing negative affect as a control variable. At time two, we're going to grab integration supplies, and that's going to be Ken and comfort. We wanted to differentiate between the two because merely, again, having the opportunity to do so may be different than having the comfort in doing so being okay. And then at time three, we're grabbing our range of outcome variables in the health, work, and family domains. We're testing all this in one model using a path analysis. So um, today, I'm only going to be showing you time one and time two. The reason why is our participant counts. The study is still ongoing for data collection. So these figures are as of last week. Um, we're also only reporting on same-sex presenting couples within this data set. So we had 591 people who passed the attention checks at time one. Of those, we've currently had 278 take time two. Gotta love attrition. Um, 250 of those passed attention checks. That's the data I'll be talking about today. We have 28 in the queue. And then at time three, we have 123 with 96 in the queue to be sent in the next few weeks. Um, given the large number of people that are waiting to take time three, it's almost half. It's almost equivalent to our current amount of counts. Um, I'm only gonna be showing time one and time two and please treat today's results as preliminary analyses accordingly. So in terms of who do we have thus far, pretty normal sample, at least from a demographic standpoint, minus the LGBT aspect. The 31 years old, 80% white, median incomes in the $50,000 range, four-year college degree, they work about 40 hours a week, they work about 80% of that week in person, and they've been with their company for about four years. Relevant to this study is we had 151 man-man presenting relationships, so men dating men, 99 women dating women. Of these, we had 50 that were romantically evolved, uh, romantically involved, <laughs> um, 128 lived together, and then we had a series of those that were in domestic partnerships, currently engaged or married. The average relationship length was about five years, so long-term committed relationships to say the least. So what did we find? I'm gonna focus on those correlations to start. Um, as it turns out, for formal inclusion factors, don't really seem to be all that predictive of inclusion supply, of integration supplies. Um, none of these relationships were significant. By comparison, the informal supplies had what I would call a whopper of a correlation, uh, 0.45 and 0.38 to those Ken and Comfort measures of work family integration supplies. So it's not just what does the handbook say, but what is actually okay in your work group. Beyond that, like I said, we broke it into Ken and Comfort. What we're seeing here is a very strong relationship between Ken and Comfort. So I want to talk more about that and how that informs our later analyses. So this is the relationship between Ken and Comfort. Ken is on the x-axis. Um, comfort is on the y-axis. As we see, that is a very strong correlation. Um, we don't really see many scores in the top left or the top right. So it's not really as orthogonal as we'd like it to be if these are distinct factors. Accordingly, again, some evidence that we might just want to treat this as one measure. Beyond that, the distributions of the two, again, very, very similar in terms of the shape, structure, mean, bounds, so on and so forth. 
So some evidence there that Ken and Comfort might be overlapping. Because of that, we opted to focus on the Ken supplies because that more so overlaps with the existing work family literature. As we're seeing here, um, informal inclusion signals, again, we do see that strong positive relationship such that having a more inclusive environment is related to the perception that you have more ability if you were to want to do so to allow your work and your family lives to overlap and integrate. As a supplemental analysis, we were curious. We broke this up to see if it was different for participants that were men versus women. Um, we only have one member of each couple within this data set. And some preliminary evidence suggests that this relationship may actually vary um, among gay men and lesbian women, such that it may actually be stronger for men, implying that we may need to consider more narrowly those different groups to see the different um, struggles that are going on there. So I threw a lot of information at you in the last 13 minutes or so. So I'm gonna wrap this up with a quick little takeaway slide. What I want you to take away from the theoretical model, the work family literature is extremely robust. It tells us so many things, but it has not thoroughly captured all families. Um, we need more research on the LGBTQ plus community if we are to provide the right resources to allow the best outcomes across the board and maximize employee health. Beyond that, one aspect that is unique here does seem to be family visibility. Um, the idea being that you can make your partner known, seen, heard about while at work. And then three is that the supplies to make one's family visible may depend on one's workplace and have broad outcomes that range across the work, family, and health domains. What I'd like you to take away from my preliminary data is that availability and comfort of are rather similar from a measurement perspective. Um, conceptually speaking, this may be because without comfort, you can't, um, essentially speaking, so that may be why that overlap is occurring. Beyond that is informal inclusion signals may be a better um, predictor than formal policy is putting forth that it's not merely enough to have the right words in your handbook, but you actually have to create an environment that is truly inclusive if you want people to act as though their families are valued and that it's a safe space to allow them to be seen within. And lastly is that we may see that this relationship varies across different groups, so we may need to consider all of the various groups underneath that LGBTQ plus umbrella if we are to provide the resources needed for all of these people to maximize and have the most fulfilling and healthy lives as possible. Um, my last slide, just the reference page. Thank you all for having me. And again, thank you to the ERC for your funding and support, um, not just on this project, but for the last few years. I really appreciate y'all. All right, thank you so much. Our next speaker is gonna be joining us virtually. Uh, Dr. Lee is from University of Central Florida and is going to be talking about daily stressors, coping behaviors, and employee well-being and hospitality. I'll give it just a moment to come up here on the screen. Hi. All right, thank you, welcome. Hi, uh, I'd like to wait a little bit until the slides are up. I'm not sure, okay. All right, um, good afternoon, and thank you for joining the session today. I would also like to thank Sunshine ERC for supporting the project and for providing the opportunity to present some of the findings today. My name is Jusup, and I am postdoctoral scholar at the University of Central Florida. Uh, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the project titled Daily Stressors, Coping Behaviors, and Employee Wellbeing in Hospitality. Next slide, please. So what's special about employees in the hospitality industry? Uh, providing ex excellent customer service is one of the major responsibilities of employees in the hospitality inter industry. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, job stressors such as job insecurity, uh, personal health concerns, and concerns about spreading the virus to others have weighed heavily on many employees. However, low quality interactions with customers, uh, go back please. However, uh, low quality interactions with customers presented additional challenges, in-person facial covering and physical distancing requirements or uh, slower service from labor shortages and limited service offerings left many customers impatient and frust frustrated and it can lead customers to direct their anger and frustration toward employees. Regardless, employees in the hospitality industries um, are required to provide high quality customer service to uncivil customers. 
So to better understand the impact of interacting with unsavvy customers, we investigated the influence of customer incivility on hospitality employees' well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. All right, so, um, and we did so across two studies using different research methodologies. In the first study, we used experience sampling methodology uh, where participants were asked to complete identical surveys multiple times a day. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, 65 hospitality employees were recruited from uh, Prolific, which is um, an online recruitment platform. And they responded to at least one pair of uh, I'm going to talk about it a little bit in more detail in, in the next slide, but it's going to be an end of the shift survey and also a beginning of the shift survey and over seven consecutive days. Um, the majority of the sample were female and white, and also uh, most of them were in food and beverage service sector. And in the second study, we used the time lagged survey design over four weeks to find ways to reduce the number of unhealthy eating episodes to improve the long term well being of hospitality employees. So, uh, 150 hospitality employees, again, they were recruited from Prolific a platform and they participated over four weeks. And majority of them were female and white, Caucasian, and also, um, also in the food and beverage service sector. Next page, please. So uh, the customer incivility is low intensity customer uh, perpetrated mistreatment uh, in violation of social norms of mutual respect and courtesy. So the examples include uh, like snapping fingers or screaming, hey, over here uh, to get attention from an employee. Not surprisingly, employees who experience customer incivility are more likely to experience negative effect at the end of the work shift. Therefore, we uh, provided our first hypothesis as Customer instability is positively related to employee end of shift negative affect. So once experiencing negative affect, what would they do? Uh, so the literature on emotional eating, comfort eating, and self-medication models of eating behaviors all suggest that people are inclined to make unhealthy food choices uh, to treat their negative moods. Therefore, we expect that uh, negative affect and the, at the end of shift is positively related to the number of unhealthy eating behavior episodes until the following shift. We defined unhealthy eating behaviors as consuming deep fried food and sugar sweetened snacks and beverages as defined by previous research. So therefore our hypothesis too is negative affect at the end of uh, a shift is positively related to the number of unhealthy eating behaviors until the following shift. So our last hypothesis uh, is about a moderating effect. And um, the rationale for that is if employees consume unhealthy food to cope with negative affect, then consuming unhealthy food should actually reduce the negative affect. So uh, we hypothesize that unhealthy eating behaviors moderates the indirect effect of customer instability on the beginning of new shift negative affect via the end of previous shift negative affect. More specifically, the detrimental effect of customer incivility will be lower uh, for those who report more episodes of unhealthy eating behaviors. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the result for the study one and all hypotheses were supported uh, in more detail. Uh, there was a statistical uh, significant, um, there was a statistically significant uh, positive association between customer incivility and end of shift uh, negative affect and also between the end of shift the negative affect and unhealthy eating behaviors at the within person level. So, um, so the next uh, hypothesis was the, about the moderating effect or the conditional indirect effect. So the ind index of mediated moderation for the conditional indirect effect of customer incivility uh, on the beginning of new shift negative affect uh, was also significant. Next slide, please. So you can see here how that moderating effect looks like. So the, the solid line is for those people who uh, reported less unhealthy eating behaviors. And uh, compared to the those people who had more unhealthy eating behavior who are the dotted line, uh, the effect of uh, negative affect on the effect of the at the end of previous shift ne negative affect on the beginning of new shift negative affect uh, was higher for those who did not engage in unhealthy eating behaviors. Next slide, please. So uh, the study two was um, about 
if the reason employees engage in unhealthy eating behaviors is to regulate their negative mood, um, alternative measures to control negative effects should help employees make less unhealthy eating choices. Relaxation experiences help individuals to recuperate from uh, work stress and are also associated with better mood and improved psychological resources. Therefore, we expected that employees' relaxation experiences uh, during non-work time uh, would mitigate the effect of customer incivility on unhealthy eating behaviors through negative affect. So our hypothesis four is that relaxation experiences will moderate the indirect effect of customer incivility on unhealthy eating behaviors uh, through negative affect, such that these indirect relationships are weaker or not significant for those who had a better uh, recovery uh, than those who did not. Next slide, please. So again, uh, the index of mediated moderation for the conditional indirect effects of customer incivility on unhealthy eating behavior um, was significant. Next page, please. As you can see here again, uh, this is how the moderating effect looks like. Uh, for those who had high relaxation experiences, uh, which is the dotted line, uh, the, the effect of negative effect on unhealthy eating behaviors were lower uh, than those who had less uh, low relaxation experiences during the time. Uh, next slide, please. So the summary uh, is that so employees who experienced customer instability uh, experienced more negative effect and negative effect was also associated with increased episodes of unhealthy eating behaviors. And the second uh, outcome was, uh, second finding was the engaging in unhealthy eating behaviors uh, lowered the detrimental effect of customer incivility on the negative effect at the beginning of the next shift. And the final uh, finding was engaging in relaxing experiences uh, lowered uh, the influence of customer incivility on unhealthy eating behaviors. So uh, after uh, this project, I mean, future plans for uh, the, this project is that currently the study that I'm reporting right now uh, is um, under development for the full manuscript. But before that, uh, we are going to present uh, this study at the annual meeting uh, for uh, the Society for IO, IO Psychology, meaning the Industrial and Organizational Psychology in April. And other than that, um, we have a multiple other projects coming out of the data set, uh, including uh, recently we had one paper published in um, the journal named Stress and Health uh, about incivility. Uh, and also we have two other projects currently under development uh, about illegitimate tasks um, for uh, hospitality employees. And finally, uh, we are planning on writing up a grant proposal to help employees uh, to reduce the number of unhealthy eating episodes uh, through relaxation and recovery interventions. Uh, next page, please. So that is gonna be uh, the conclusion of my study. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, speakers are Wheeler Nakahara and Dr. Michael DeStaso from University of Central Florida, who are also going to talk about uh, emerging issues in hospitality. <coughs> They'll be joining us virtually. Do we sound okay? <laughs> right. awesome. Great, thank you. Welcome. Great. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, like we just introduced, we're uh, studying emerging issues in hospitality. Um, kind of at the time that we sampled this data, it was a very um, tumultuous and disruptive time for hospitality workers around that kind of mid-2021. So um, this is kind of a study that um, looked at a couple of the problems that hospitality workers were facing at the time. Uh, next slide, please. So again, um, the goal of our study uh, was to examine um, two occupationally health relevant phenomena uh, that were impacting customer facing hospitality workers. And um, so in particular, hospitality workers cognitions about future mistreatment. Um, if you think about all the things that you were seeing in the news around, you know, having to uh, wear masks and, um, you know, videos from planes about people freaking out about it. Um, you know, this was clear. This is a very salient thing happening um, in the news. Uh, in addition, um, we wanted to study the impact of change on hospitality workers. Um, 
So organizations have had to respond a lot, um, especially in recent times due to COVID-19, um, in particular for the hospitality industry, um, really big layoffs. You know, people are not, you know, going out a lot um, to restaurants, food, um, and then kind of towards the end when the world started to open up again, um, they started to face labor shortages. So again, really disruptive time um, and a really interesting time to do this kind of research and study how people respond to change. Uh, more recently, too, NIOSH has recognized organizational changes as an emerging priority area and something that's very relevant to employees' well-being, especially when changes are mismanaged. And so these are kind of two of the areas that we're tackling. And again, we're going to break this up into kind of two studies. Um, Michael's going to present on the um, first area, and then I'll present on the second one. Um, next slide, please. And so again, kind of just starting at the top, um, you know, our contributions to research, we want to understand if past mistreatments experience, uh, past mistreatment experiences influence anticipated mistreatment experiences, and what does this mean for employee well-being? And in terms of change, um, how do changes influence hospitality workers' mental well-being? Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, I'll get started about study one. Um, so my name is Michael DiStazzo. I'm um, a recent graduate of UCF's Industrial and Organizational Psychology program. And I, um, within that, my research area is occupational health psychology. And so in, uh, I wanted to study future mistreatment. And the, the reason I wanted to study it is because I thought that the research approaches um, that were pretty dominant in occupational health psychology were looking at mistreatment in a vacuum, meaning that it was sort of with the context taken out of it. And specifically, I would hear from um, my colleagues and, and from workers in the service industry that over time you learn to expect so that there's this expectation that you'll be mistreated as part of your work role. And there wasn't really anything in the literature about that topic. Um, so my research questions for this study were, A, what does it mean to expect mistreatment? And then B, what are the causes and consequences of that? Uh, so you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and I broke up this concept of expecting mistreatment into two different buckets, um, a, a cognitive component and an emotional component. So mistreatment anticipation is the cognitive component. That's a judgment about how likely you are to be mistreated at work. And then mistreatment anxiety is the emotional component. So that would be the emotions that you experience um, when you think you could be mistreated in the future. So people feeling anxious uh, when they think they could be mistreated. Uh, next slide, please. And so breaking this into, uh, I'll, I'll try to do it into three little parts um, and, and go through it pretty quickly. Um, the first part of my model, um, which is part of my dissertation, concerns the predictors of mistreatment anticipation. And there we broke uh, uh, into the predictors into direct cues and indirect cues. And for my dissertation specifically, um, past mistreatment was considered the direct cue. Um, it can be me being the individual being mistreated, or I could witness other people being mistreated at work. Um, so that would be sort of their past mistreatment bucket. And then the service recovery, that, that's a, um, a label coming from the hospitality management literature, and that reflects the extent to which hospitality service employees' interactions with customers um, are comprised of addressing customer complaints about perceived service failures. Um, so we can go to the next slide um, concerning the back end of the model. Uh, this one is pretty straightforward. Uh, the idea is that mistreatment anxiety over time is going to result in emotional exhaustion and other sorts of strain. But uh, for my dissertation study, we focused on emotional exhaustion specifically. And then uh, the last part of my model, uh, I think on the next slide, uh, concerns the possibility that not all people who expect mistreatment will worry about it. And so my proposal is here that there's a key moderator, which is anticipated consequences. Um, so if you think that you will be mistreated at work, and also um, you think that uh, someone mistreating you has the power to give you poor evaluations um, or, or potentially make you lose your job, um, then that's the case where you're going to experience the most mistreatment anxiety. So customer ratings reflects the formal ways that customers can evaluate workers, and I suggest that's a really critical moderator here. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a two-part survey study um, with some participants based on the uh, in the Orlando area and some uh, participants recruited online. Um, and I, we have the participant demographics. Um, 
And uh, the other thing I'll note about this is that this is a two part. Um, so th there are participants that completed a time one survey and then uh, a follow up survey was administered two weeks later. Um, and uh, uh, we can go to the next slide. All right. So quick snapshot of the results. So past mistreatment and both uh, service or care recovery as a job characteristic were positively associated with mistreatment and anticipation, um, as I expected on my hypotheses. Um, mistreatment anxiety was positively associated with emotional exhaustion. And then mistreatment anticipation um, was positively associated with mistreatment anxiety, but in specific cases. So we found evidence of that moderating effect that I mentioned earlier. The association was strongest when customer ratings were high. So if you had a high mistreatment anticipation and also um, you were in a work situation where customers could rate your performance, then that was the situation where your mistreatment anxiety was highest. Uh, next slide, please. And then just to sort of quickly um, showcase the results, this is a, a graphing of the interaction term. Um, and it sort of shows that, uh, that the, the high, um, levels of mistreatment anticipation, and also the high levels of customer ratings are what is resulting in the highest levels of mistreatment anxiety. Uh, next slide, please. And then just to sort of wrap up, um, so this th there are theoretical and uh, practical implications here. And just very quickly, um, mistreatment anticipation and mistreatment anxiety, when I use those and Maybe it didn't come through in this presentation, but they're similar concepts, but we should be treating them separate because they are separate, even though they sound pretty similar. Um, and the other thing that I'll point out is customer ratings can be harmful based on uh, you know, my findings from my study. Um, and they, A, reinforce this customer's always right perspective, um, and um, that can worsen mistreatment anxiety in the cases where you know, these service workers have jobs where they're expecting these negative interactions with customers. So I'm going to stop there. I, that was a very, very brief snapshot of my study. Um, I'll turn it over to Wheeler. Uh, happy to take questions afterwards. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, next slide, please. So again, part of this grant um, and funding we received um, for my dissertation, I was looking specifically at how organizational changes impacted hospitality workers. So next slide. Awesome. Okay. And um, so again, brief kind of introduction on theory. Um, so changes that greatly alter how employees work or disrupt their daily routines are theorized to be especially stressful. Um, and there's kind of this idea of studying this as a characteristic. So rather than thinking about layoffs, downsizings, um, mergers, um, restructuring, more just kind of asking employees, how impactful was this change to your daily routines? Um, and again, um, this idea is that they disrupt daily routines, and because of this, changes that are more extensive or more uh, large in magnitude, more disruptive, should be appraised as more threatening to employees. Um, some of this may be because they're, you know, getting more job demands as a result of the changes going on, or um, in some cases, this may also re force them to reevaluate um, their fit in their organization. Um, and... Throughout the change literature, changes have been found to culminate in negative employee outcomes. So worse job performance, worse job attitudes, more strain. Um, and so in line with this, um, I expected that threat appraisal as a mediating mechanism um, would be associated with worse employee related outcomes that explain how um, highly impactful, larger in magnitude changes um, would result in more uh, worse employee outcomes. Um, so next slide, please. And so this is the theoretical model that I propose, or at least part of it. Um, and it's, um, again, kind of based on the literature that I described earlier, um, with the idea being um, when employees experience a large change, they'll praise it as uh, more threatening and experience worse emotional exhaustion as a result of that. And um, this is kind of a newer idea um, in the change literature. Um, kind of asking employees rather than just assuming change is something negative, asking employees how they actually perceive it, um, and kind of understanding how these changes impact employees' um, well-being. So again, kind of like Michael's study, the key emotion or outcome here is emotional exhaustion. Um, also, again, since this literature um, is fairly new, um, 
there haven't been a lot of outcomes studied in terms of appraisals of change and what that means for employees. So people have looked at turnover, for instance, um, as well as engagement, but still trying to understand this from like a well-being perspective, what other sort of um, mental strain might um, highly or uh, how might uh, changes that are appraised as threatening and act um, mental well-being. And then the last hypothesis is this positive indirect effect uh, on emotional exhaustion um, through threat appraisals. Um, next slide, please. Um, Michael kind of went over the participants and procedures already. The only thing that I'll comment on is that we did ask employees to report a recent change um, just to kind of get them thinking about um, that event. Um, and they were asked to think about a change that had occurred in the last month to be eligible for this study. Um, the majority of the um, changes that were experienced by employees did have to do with labor shortages, um, but um, they also mentioned things like responsibilities changing, um, the way that they go about their job changing. And, and so kind of just a little bit of information on the ch changes experience there. Um, so next slide, please. And um, in terms of the results, um, so we did in fact find that more extensive changes uh, participants were more likely to appraise these as threatening. Um, in turn, threat appraisals were positively related to emotional exhaustion. So when employees thought that this was, you know, particularly harmful for their well-being or would be detrimental for their well-being, they did experience worse emotional exhaustion. And this was partially mediated um, by uh, extent of or threat appraisals, rather. And so it's possible that there's other variables out there um, that do explain how ex extensive changes culminate in worse emotional uh, exhaustion for employees. Um, but next slide. And finally, in terms of like theory and practical implications, so um, in theory, hospitality work uh, workers, sorry for the little typo, appraise larger changes as more threatening to their well-being, um, and in turn, threat appraisals partially explain this positive indirect. It's uh, you know potentially things like uncertainty that have been studied in the change literature um, with the idea of big changes. Um, this can result in a lot of uncertainty when you're at work, um, and in turn, result in worse uh, outcomes. So. Um, you know, our theories are never perfect. There's probably other uh, variables that explain how extensive changes culminate in worse emotional uh, exhaustion. And then practical implications, um, you know, this research kind of highlights how it's important to intervene when employees indicate that changes are threatening to their well-being. Um, so, you know, communicating with them, asking them how they're doing, if they start to show that, hey, this is a situation that is going to be um, potentially harmful for them and really stressing them out. Um, you know, try to intervene then before it, you know, culminates in worse emotional exhaustion. And but then also kind of in the idea of prevention, um, make sure that employees are prepared for change um, and providing communication, helping them understand how this is going to impact or changes are going to impact them at work. So potentially they don't see it as threatening. They can be engaged in that feedback process uh, and communication with their organization. And, and so, yeah, that's, uh, we can go to the next slide. So we went through this pretty quickly. Again, we're talking about two studies, but we did want to thank the Sunshine ERC. Um, I am graduating in the uh, spring, um, but Michael has already graduated, and we're really appreciative um, of the work and uh, or the um, the funding to uh, for our dissertations. Um, and, you know, through that grant, we're uh, uh, we've both been able to graduate. Um, or I'll be able to graduate um, in this coming spring. But yeah, we're very grateful for the opportunity um, to present this research and thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions or comments now. Feel free to come up to the front or share in the chat. That's a lot of information this afternoon. And I just want to thank this last panel for all of the, the theoretical and conceptual work that you've done as well. Uh, I've got questions basically for everybody. So um, for uh, the first talk, in your future work, are you going to consider the impacts of like medication or other like stimulants like coffee or energy drinks? I assume that they're like pounding coffee most of the day? Yeah, that was definitely one thing that we hadn't considered as we were doing this particular study, and also the fact that we, that might also be one of the reasons why we saw such a cornucopia of results when it came to the heart rate variability. Um, and 
moving forward, one of the issues we actually had with the sensor as well was it was actually overestimating the amount of sleep that they were getting as well. So we think that the sensor may have also been influencing some of those values as well. So we're moving forward, trying to stay more towards subjective measures and also doing more um, uh, either sleep journaling or logging uh, what their intake is and stuff like that to count for moving forward. All right, great. Uh, next, um, do you, are you seeing cases where, um, I'm trying to think, like a, a workplace has low integration sort of across the board, like they don't want to hear about your family no matter who you are, or uh, are we seeing cases where it's like, um, you know, um, non-minority couples have high integration and, and these LGBTQ plus couples have less integration or is there a way to really suss that out? So there is, and we tried to do so in a few different ways. So part one is, um, when the study started out, we were only grabbing, um, only sampling same-sex presenting couples. Um, within those questions, we did have a what are the general norms of your workplace question um, that we could use as a control variable. Part two is as we kept sampling, we realized we needed to kind of find other ways to supplement to add in additional questions that'd be helping, helpful, because as it turns out, recruitment is always more difficult than you expect it to be. Um, and we do have heterosexual couples as a comparison group now. So we will be able to answer those questions. I think they're really good questions, um, and I'm excited to dive into it. Great. Uh, for our third speaker, um, I think you mentioned this. Uh, I was wondering if some of these like poor eating behaviors were specifically being looked at as a response to the, the stress or the negative affect, or is it, could it also just be that people who work in hospitality eat uh, fried food a lot in general? Uh, that's totally possible. I think we cannot completely rule out <laughs> that um, possibility, but I think the what what I could do in the model of uh, uh, the analysis uh, was kind of specifically designed to you know like uh, find the, the indirect effect of customer instability on uh, unhealthy eating behaviors. So I, I'd like to um, mention that I mean although we cannot completely rule out that possibility, but uh, at least what I found in uh, my study is that uh, there are some indirect effects of customer instability on unhealthy eating behaviors. Okay, great, and then. Um... For our, our last pair, um, it seems like both of you sort of had a, a point where emotional exhaustion was the, the end result uh, for both of your, your studies. Um, what would be a way to explain to, like what is the, the negative for the employer and how do you get the employer to buy in where uh, they can intervene in a way that makes sure that emotional exhaustion is something that's they want to reduce in their workplace. And uh, thank you for all of our presenters. And thank you for questions. Uh, Michael, I'll let you take the course, or if you have any thoughts. Sure, I do have some thoughts. Um, so I think it would probably be outside the context of my specific study, but there are a lot of studies sort of linking emotional exhaustion to performance indicators. And I think that would probably be the route that you could take to sort of get employer buy-in. Um, but if you have any other thoughts, we'll um, But uh, that's that's how I would think. Sorry, in terms of buy-in, um, for me, I think um, you know at this time again, um, especially in the hospitality or industry, um, this was a time where they were facing a lot of labor shortages, and that can be extremely stressful for your remaining staff. Um, and uh, retaining employees. Um, and so for me, from like, a, uh, you know, like another company, a company perspective or an organization perspective, um, you know, it's also been found that changes are associated with turnover and that can be costly for organizations as well. So beyond just the beneficial effects for employees and thinking about how you can manage um, them and support their well-being, um, you know, that's also for the organization a very relevant outcome too. Um, so making sure that you can retain your employees, um, you know, and have a, you know, a workplace where you can kind of meet those demands, so. We have a, we have a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, this is for all speakers, uh, speaking uh, mostly though to uh, customer interactions. Uh, what kind of interventions do the speakers feel would be most effective? 
uh, such as maybe training for employees, new policies for employers, or settling, setting expectations for customers using communications. Yeah, um, so I have seen actually very recently, uh, and actually, I, I actually at, at the vet I went to recently, uh, there have been signs sort of uh, setting a standard for uh, what, what treatment is expected in terms of the, the customer and employee interactions. And I do think that probably makes a difference, although I haven't seen the specific research on that. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is within the context of my specific study is what I've looked at is uh, formal outlets for customer ratings of uh, employees. And it does suggest that um, that those uh, customer ratings or, or formal ways are, are harmful and, and that they um, worsen mistreatment anxiety. So I would suggest instead that they think of other ways. So I, I think um, customer evaluations of employees is probably the easiest way to sort of get performance indicators, but there are definitely other ways that employers could go about, um, you know, compiling performance or uh, information for employees. So I would try to sign, uh, find something else because that one, obviously, um, it, it isn't the best way. And thank you for the question. And um, I have some thoughts too. So when you... Um... When it comes to the intervention research, I think there are three types of interventions. One is primary intervention, meaning that you have you can get rid of the stressors itself. But a lot of times it's impossible to do. I mean, you cannot like outright prevent like customers from like engaging in un unsafe behaviors. So it's it's usually like less less practical, I think. Uh, and other approaches are like a secondary intervention, which is like, so uh, customer mistreatment happened and, and how employees can react to that. So like there, are, there might be some uh, trainings that could be done for the employees and the managers so that they can uh, kind of mitigate the, uh, the situation. Um, and the third type is um, to, so once you are stressed out because of the customer mistreatment and then what are you gonna do about it? So um, my research mostly focuses on like, so, okay, so you are stressed out because of customer civility. So how can we help um, stressed out employees to uh, recover from the work stress? So for me, um, it is, my approach is to you know, help them uh, relax during non-work time. So um, that's, that's kind of uh, one approach that I'm taking. Um, I just had a question regarding the environments that you were sam getting your uh, sample from and were different workplaces showing different kind of integration or different kind of um, support from the workplace in general for LGBTQ plus individuals. And then my second question was, you mentioned same sex presenting couples. Does that include, are, you, are we looking at sex? Or are we looking at gender? Are you including like trans individuals, non-binary individuals, things like that, just for clarification. Yeah, so that second part's on me. I, I misspoke. It was same gender presenting. Um, it was self-reported on what what do you, what is how do you present? How does your partner present? Um, so our overarching population within our study is overwhelmingly um, men dating men or women dating women. We do have a smaller subset that is a variety of other types. Um, what's interesting that I'm excited to dive into is I have a decent number of people who identify as LGBT, but are in heterosexual presenting relationships, which I think is a very interesting control group. So we do have some of that information in there. I think there's gonna be some really cool stuff out of that. Um, our other numbers are probably a bit too small to really do too much with, but you never know. Um, and then the first part of your question was different environments. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have the inclusion supplies part. Um, so that's going, I'm sorry, we do have the formal and informal um, signals part. So that's going to tap into culture. We did have some variance there. Um, policies and procedures. Most companies have written down the right things in the book. We're not seeing as much variance there, which is probably why those relationships are pretty small. Um, in terms of occupations, we actually have a fair amount of lawyers, um, teachers, nurses. So we do have some a number of different jobs covered in there. I didn't cover it here, but um, we have quite a different, quite a mismatch of different occupations. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you for your question. Hey, one more question here. Two more. <laughs> very good presentations, everyone. Um, my question is for the last group. We talked about organizational change. 
Um, I wondered if you also are looking in the leadership literature, because organizational and organizational uh, development has a lot to do with the leadership and the setting. So I didn't hear you say much about that. Um, yeah, I haven't looked as much. Um, I know there is some um, research on like different leadership types um, and things out there. Um, but at least in terms of like immediate manager support and the people who are interacting with mm -hmm. um, those employees on a more face-to-face -face basis, um, there is some evidence about how providing manager support, even for employees who report that they're just uh, like have a disposition to resist change, they may even see opportunities for growth and opportunity. Um, so I definitely think there is something there in terms of the immediate managers and how supportive they are. Um, mm -hmm. I know that's not exactly like the, um, like in terms of like leadership, you know, either approaches or types, but um, yeah, I think there definitely is something there in terms of how your immediate manager um, yeah. handles those changes and interacts with those immediate employees. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you to all the presenters, that was very informative. Uh, I have a two-part question for Jacob. Um, the first part is you discussed previously um, when you were looking at the amounts of data that you were collecting, you were focusing on um, the number of calls that were going out mm -hmm. and as well as the time away from station. My question is, is did you or would you consider, and if not, why not, would you consider the time out on call on site? as well in terms of relationships to levels of exhaustion or exhaustive activities. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question is, and it may be more relatable to your future work, uh, which is, do you, would you consider uh, role isolations in terms of looking at terms of exhaustion? Um, it's well documented that most firefighters um, have multi roles within on site, uh, going from either hose man or uh, you know, through barrier penetrations uh, to determine fire, uh, special structure fires. And then that role changes immediately in a role of management. So, would you consider including that or would you isolate that as well? Yeah, no, those are both, <clears throat> both great questions. So, to answer your first question, um, the reason that we quantified it in the way that we did was we were limited to whatever we received from the dispatch codes. So the way that they uh, gave us, the reports that we got was the time that dispatch, the dispatch came in, and then the total time commitment, what they referred to it as, was the moment that dispatch came in and the tones go off in the station, and then when they got back to the station, it was when they finished it. So that was kind of an inherent limitation to the data that we were given. Um, but I certainly see where you're coming from. But to your other point with uh, looking at roles in between uh, uh, for each firefighter, depending on what they're doing, that's actually one of the things I'm looking at moving forward with the, the, the uh, future work that I'm looking at for the remainder of my dissertation is looking at how changes in not only the call volume and workload, but also how changes week to week, if there's any increase or percent increase, decrease, and how that may influence the rate at which that they're having to switch the roles while they're on duty, whether, for example, if they're on an ambulance, for example, the um, demand would be certainly different if they're driving the ambulance versus if they're directly interacting with the patient, whether administering meds, et cetera, or as you were saying, being a hose man at a working structure fire versus if they're more doing like uh, kind of delegating kind of a role. So that's another piece that I'm looking at, uh, hopefully in, in waiting on a IRB. <laughs> Right. One more round of applause for our final panelists. Thank you very much. I want to take a couple of minutes now to, um, to recognize um, out of the so many excellent poster presenters that we had, um, so many articulate and passionate presenters. Um, I hope you had a chance to meet with them last night. Um, we did have some award winners um, who will receive kudos from us and a cash prize. Um, so we did have two categories from the judging for awards, and that's uh, doctoral level and master's level. So I'd like to, um, if they're here, or maybe there's a, another representative from their center, um, 
recognize our runner-up for the doctoral uh, award, Nathan Chen, who presented on evaluation of hand-arm vibration exposure among groundskeepers in southeastern United States. So congratulations to Nathan. And also our winner of the doctoral category for posters, Andreas Menrique. You're here. Personal exposure to occupational PM25 and respiratory health among Florida crop farm workers. So congratulations. <laughs> if you're here, I have something for you. Or your representative. I know we're at the tail end of our conference here. I also wanted to rec uh, recognize at the master's level, Liza Maria Irizarry Colon for great congratulations, Moon Exploration, Literature Review on Lunar Dust. Got this for you here. And our winner at the master's level, Nora Abbott on Bayesian Maximum Entropy Framework for Environmental BTEX Test. Estimation to inform total exposure in the United States Gulf region. Congratulations. Great job. follow up on this. Um, I also want to thank um, John Staley for co-moderating today. If you had other comments, feel free to come up. Um, and just want to just want to recognize so much synergy and overlap among all of us here across our, our centers and researchers um, in terms of the workforces that we care about, the occupational safety and health issues that we care about. Um, Please complete the evaluation. There's a QR code. And also, please reach out to at least one person that you met at this conference, um, you know, before you leave or when you get back. Um, and let's build some, some more collaborations across our centers um, to expand this great pilot work that we've, we've heard about. So thank you. Safe travels. And um, thanks so much. <laughs>